Before we get started, I want to remind everybody, everybody who calls me up and is like, hey, I love that flying tiger logo from the Loftus party. That's a flying tiger that breathes fire. That's a sweet logo. Do you have gear? <laughs> the answer is yes. Go to theloftusparty.com, click on gear. There are pint glasses, there are messenger bags, there's tote bags, there's t-shirts and keychains. Oh my goodness! Go look for yourself. Get a little something, and get a little something for the person you love. All the money that we raise goes to a charity, and that charity is American Express. Because at the Loftus Party, uh, we love America, and we need to express it every 30 days, or they're going to tell us to stop using the card. I love you. I'm Michael Loftus. Here comes a podcast. Das Vidanya. Hey, welcome to the Loftus Party, the most exciting hour on the intranet. Das Vidanya. It's Michael Loftus here, uh, and across the country, joining me is Andrew Apple. How's it going, Andrew? It's pretty good. I'm actually on fire right now with the rest of the greater California area because so much of the city is burning. Oh, yeah, yeah, up in Santa Clarita. Yeah, they got some serious fires. I mean, I was uh, I was at the Hollywood Bowl last night, and you could see just the mountains are just covered in ash and smoke. We can't even open up our windows right now. Holy smoke. Now is the time to take that magic ring and destroy it. Uh, you and your buddy Samwise Gamgee, you got to make that trek up there and destroy that ring. Only if you can sing in Elvish the entire way, Michael. Ha, <laughs> ha, No, that's up to... Uh... Oh, Alicia. Oh, that's right. That's right. She doesn't speak Elvis. She just knows all the Lord of the Rings, and we love that. But if if we could get, uh, oh, who's the girl that played the elf in the movie? Oh, uh, Liv Tyler. Yeah, you get Liv Tyler. Oh, my goodness. You get her speaking Elvis. I'll do whatever. Anyway, enough uh, enough of the geek talk. It is a bad fire. I hope they, it's why I never bought a house up there. Yeah. Honestly, I looked at houses up there, and I'm like, no, thank you. It, it's really eerie when the smoke comes and the sun shining on it. It really does. It looks like uh, Mount Doom from Lord of the Rings. That's why I said that. So let's jump right into the news. We have we have so so much to cover. Let's talk about Cleveland. Let's talk about the the Republican National Convention. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, hashtag RNC and CLE. That's what they're using on Twitter these days. But we just had the convention. When it's from still trending. It is still trending. It is. Although uh, right now you also have to deal with DNC and PHI. Yes. Yes, that's the new one. Yes. So there was a whole bunch of news that had came out of the RNC. Uh, what was your favorite moment, Michael? I tell you what, I had a lot of favorite moments uh, in terms of just pure drama. Yeah. Was the Ted was the Ted Cruz speech? Okay. Right. Yeah. That was that was just drama. And then I love love loved Newt Gingrich's uh, follow up. And uh, you know what? I I I dug uh, I dug Mike Pence, and then I felt sorry for Donald Trump. There's so much to cover. Let's let's start with the Ted Cruz thing because okay. that's that's the biggie, right? Yeah. Uh, the non endorsement did Donald Trump. I have to think that Donald Trump read the speech ahead of time. Of course. And I think everybody knew what was going to happen. And I think uh, Ted Cruz thought he could get away with, hey. Uh, in November, you have to vote your conscience, right? Yeah. Up and down the ticket. So that was his way of supporting uh, supporting the candidate and supporting the Republicans everywhere. The reason people were booing, and I love how this is getting like taken completely out of context. The reason people were booing is because they were waiting for Ted Cruz to say the words, that's why I want to make America great again and I support Donald Trump. That's why they just wanted Ted Cruz to say the guy's name. Everybody knows that uh, the Republican candidate will be, uh, you know, whoever it is, it's, you know, wh whoever they are, they're not Hillary Clinton. So when Ted Cruz says, hey, uh, you know, vote your conscience, and uh, that's his roundabout half-assed way of supporting Donald Trump, they just wanted to hear the words come out of his mouth. Well, what do you say to those that this is really uh, Ted Cruz's way of positioning himself for the 2020 election, assuming that Donald Trump loses and Hillary wins. There is no scenario where Ted Cruz looks good in that, unless unless he would have uh, come out and with a full voice supported Donald Trump, because now he kind of looks like a traitor. 
you know? And here's the other thing. It's like, listen, if Hillary Clinton gets into the White House, it's doom and gloom. It's the end of America. If Hillary wins, it's the end of America. Well, if that is true, then you have to endorse the Republican candidate. You have to endorse the guy who you have to endorse the guy whose name is going to be on the, the, the ballot, right? Absolutely. So I guess you're lying to me. I guess you are lying, Ted Cruz. If you said uh, we can't let Hillary in, well, then if we can't let Hillary in, you have to support Donald Trump. Well, isn't Ted Cruz the candidate who just wants everything to stop? I mean, this was the guy who actually made sure that the government shut down over budgetary concerns. Hey, good for him. And I tell you what, if Ted Cruz, was, if his name was on the ballot, I'd be voting for him. I, I really don't. That's 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 where I stand. Uh, I'm normally not a big like, let's toe the line. Uh, I'm a party guy. But things have have reached a level for me and my awareness that like, no, nope, I don't need Hillary in there. I really don't need Hillary in there. So I don't like being manipulated. If you're telling me we can't let Hillary in, well, then you have to support the guy whose name is on the ballot. And and when you when all you're doing is trying to uh, wangle away and use an angle to so you can run in 2020, well, then I guess you think everything's going to be OK. I guess you think that, you know, well, we'll take four years of Hillary. That'll be fine. And then I'll be ready to go in 2020. Well, then you're a liar. So either way, Ted Cruz loses. Okay, so jumping on something else that you had talked about, uh, Mike Pence, what did you think of his speech? I liked it. I liked it. I liked that there was a little bit of humor in there, you know, and uh, he was kind of making fun of Donald Trump a little bit. Uh, he is, he's, he's a good balance for the ticket. I don't know if he's going to get any new new voters coming in. Uh, those, but you know, we'll leave that to DT. We'll leave that to Donald Trump to try to get the new voters in there. But uh, Mike Pence, I mean, let's let's be honest. Uh, Mike Pence and any any VP is. Can you imagine this person being president uh, if your candidate has been assassinated? And I think if uh, if that's the case, then Mike Pence would do just fine. He's okay. He's like completely mediocre, middle of the road, ready to go. He gives a fine speech. He did his line again. He did his line again in his speech. <laughs> I'm sure. a Christian, I'm a conservative, and I'm a Republican in that order. Wait for applause. And then he got him because it was home cooking. It was home cooking at the at the RNC and the CLE. <laughs> now, was there anything in particular from a policy perspective that you really liked in that speech? Nah, not really. I mean, I can't even. I, it's so. It was so not like not memorable. Here's the thing: people don't remember this kind of stuff. You know where people remember comedy. People remember they have a higher retention rate from comedy than they do from dry political speeches. People will remember what makes them laugh. Okay, so in your estimation, what was the funniest part of the Republican National Convention then? When Donald Trump was up there. And he goes, I want to thank the uh, evangelicals for supporting me. I want to thank you guys for supporting me. I don't think I deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. That was it, it was very funny. And, and, and yeah, that, that it just he's got great comedic timing. He has great comedic timing. And I don't think I deserve it. And then my proudest moment uh, is when oh the other funny moment yes. uh, for me the, the other funniest moment mm -hmm. was Donald Trump uh, pronouncing L B G T Q. like he so desperately did not want to mess up those initials <laughs> he was just like he like you could just see the wheels turning do not mess this up do not mess this up do not mess this up and then the standing ovation he got a standing ovation for that and then you can tell that he was off script and he wasn't at the teleprompter but he goes hey. That's I'm 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 really proud that that you guys stood up for that that that's that's a great thing. I thought that was awesome. I thought I thought that was awesome that he brought that up and uh, and everybody stood. That's that's uh, a wonderful. That made me actually a, a bit proud to be a conservative. Okay, now on that note, can you do a little Trump translation for me? Because uh, yes. there was one thing that happened on Monday night at the convention that I didn't quite understand. This isn't actually a Trump translation. This is a Chachi translation. Uh, I miss Chachi. I didn't see Chachi. Yeah, so the first night, that was where they had 
I guess their estimation of what they would call celebrities. I don't know that I would necessarily call Antonio Sabato Jr. the headliner when it comes to big name celebrities. Uh, but they had Willie Robinson from Duck Dynasty. They had uh, Antonio Sabato Jr. And they had Scott Baio. And yeah. And so Scott Baio, he's charming. He's very articulate. He explains why he's up there. Makes perfect sense. But he ends the entire speech with, let's not just make America great again. Let's make America, America again. So, Michael, what does it mean to make America, America again? I would have to – my knee-jerk reaction to that is let's make it a free and open democracy again. Let's not live under the – you know, a a presidency and a political party where executive orders are just dripping around left and right and the rule of law is not respected and we don't have borders. To me, that's – I that would be my takeaway from it. And here's the – oh, my gosh – I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to uh suffer through this AM Joy show on MSNBC. Okay. Do you know who I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, I saw her on Bill Maher this week. Oh my gosh. She had a panel of uh millennials cuz that's the vo- that's the vote everybody's chasing. She has a panel of millennials and some kid is like I'm going to vote for Donald Trump and she's like and she's like Wah! just like her claws come out and she goes after him. And she goes, what do you think of uh, Make America Great Again? He's like, I'm all for it. Uh, you know, we should make America great again. She goes, what point in time are we talking about? When was America great? What year? What year are we talking about? And the kid goes, well, I don't think we're talking about a specific year. I think we're talking about a feeling. Uh, it, it, you know, it's more of an emotion. It's having America be respected. It's having jobs back in America. Aren't you talking about a year? Make America great. What year? What year would you say? And she just wouldn't let it go. Like, like, really? That's what you think, Donald Trump? And that's what, and that's how they're trying to frame it. It's like, let's make America great again, like it was in June of 1956. That's not what he's saying. It's, it's bigger than that. And that's, that's why it kills me when they attack, oh, wait, I don't have, I don't hear any big ideas coming out of Donald Trump. His slogan is a big idea. Let's make America great again. That's a huge idea. Oh, and the other thing that I loved about his speech, when he was, and this is one, this is the one I think that there is a lot of traction here. Uh, my opponent's, uh, motto, my opponent's slogan is, uh, I'm with her, and my new slogan is, I'm with you. Boom! That was awesome. There's a, there's a lot of mileage out of that one. He needs to say that every day. Every day. Uh, so, um, let's talk about, uh, a little speculation here for a moment, because. Yes. There was a rumor going around last week that Donald Trump Jr. went to one of John Kasich's associates and said, we want you for the VP ticket, and you can uh, be in charge of foreign and domestic policy. And so this associate goes to the Donald Trump Jr. and says, well, if that's what I'm doing, what is Donald Trump doing? And Donald Trump Jr. said, oh, he's going to make America great again. And what this has kind of led to in the conversational zeitgeist is that maybe even though Donald Trump wants to win, I think all of the speculation that he's just running as a joke is a complete fallacy. I think he really wants to win, but he doesn't necessarily want to be the president of America. He wants to be the CEO of America and do a lot more delegating. Do you see any problem if that's the case? I got zero problem with that. I got zero problem with that, with, with him being the CEO in chief. That's, that's precise. It's exactly what they, uh, accused Ronald Reagan of, of wanting to do. And I have never, ever seen the problem with that. I have the best and brightest minds in their particular field. Uh, this guy knows foreign policy. This guy knows, uh, economics. This guy knows about, uh, defense spending. And, 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 and I, 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 in this case being, uh, Donald Trump, I know how to delegate responsibility. Uh, you're in charge. What do you think we should do? I think we should do this. Okay. Let's not do that much of that, but let's do this much of that. That is a wonderful thing, right? You are the man, you are the manager of America. And what in business, uh, I know a few things about business, but the best managers and the best owners of businesses create a structure a command structure beneath them that works like a well-oiled machine, even if they're not there. 
That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to create a machine that works so well and so efficiently that you can be taken out of the equation and things will still go well. Bada bing, bada boom. All right, so building on that, one of the arguments that people make about why that structure doesn't work is because when you're doing that in the business world, if you go off and you're in charge of this project and that project makes a bunch of money, then you can go back to your boss when it's time to get a raise and the boss says, yes, I am absolutely going to pay you more money. In the public sector, it doesn't work that way. There's no capitalist influence. There's no extra monetary gain for working hard and doing a good job. So can a business structure really work when there's no financial incentive to work any harder than you have to? Well, that's what you have to. I mean, you have to include, uh, I would think you'd have to include some kind of uh, incentive. Maybe that incentive is keeping your job because right now, there's no incentive to work any harder than you have to, just like you just said. That's why the DMV is such a glorious, glorious enterprise, he said, rolling his eyes. No one, there's no incentive to, to work hard. That's why when you're, when you don't have to, uh, be concerned with, with how, how efficient you are, you don't work efficiently. I mean, my goodness, look at the post office. The post office, they just sat on their laurels for the longest time. There's no competition. There's no competition. And then along comes uh, FedEx and UPS and these other. Now, uh-oh, now all of a sudden the post office has to work. That's good for everybody. My father-in-law used to run a division of the the, uh, the FAA. And boy, oh boy, it's like impossible to fire somebody. People are completely not qualified for what they do. And it's like gross negligence, but you can't fire them because if you do, uh, or if you even try to, you're going to be brought up on some kind of charges or they have some bizarre like government version of tenure. It's, you have to be able to weed out the incompetent people. And that goes to, uh, our educational system as well. We have to be able to celebrate the great teachers and we have to be able to cut the other teachers loose. Well, I mean, when we're dealing with education specifically, isn't it a lot? Just churning out a bunch of kids who don't know shit. Well, when we're dealing with education... Isn't it a lot what? I said when we're dealing with education specifically in, in that realm, I mean, how do we attract the best and the brightest teachers? I tell you what, by giving people school choice. Uh, you know what? You can go work for this school and you're going to make more money or you can work for this school and, uh, you know, whatever. I don't know the exact I don't know the exact policy, but I know that like uh, what we're doing ain't working. Well, a lot of the reason that people are actually frustrated with school is because what we're seeing right now, especially in California, is these charter networks are coming in. They're taking money out of the public schools. They're putting less money into those schools and trying to convince people that they can do a better job. But these are for-profit companies running education. Isn't that really, really dangerous? I tell you what, it, yeah, I mean, I, I'm all, like I said, I want more ch choices for parents where they can send their uh, kids to school. However, I mean, it is it is super dicey because if you say, hey, um, listen, I'm going to evaluate your students and and as if you if all your students get A's, uh, you're going to make more money because because ergo, because your students got A's, you must be a better teacher. Well, then there's an incentive uh, as the teacher to make sure all the students get A's, you know? And so you really, it's hard to qualify it. It's hard to quantify it. You just have to have more options. Oh, and here's my other thing. I would actually have, uh, I would have the school uh, budget be the school budget, right? They do this little shell game with the lottery money. Like people who own property and they pay their taxes, that money should be going towards education. But what they do is they take the lottery money, they put it in there, and they take the tax money for education, and they move it around, uh, and they put it towards other stuff. I think the the money that's taken out of your check to uh, pay for schools should pay for schools, and then the lottery money should actually be additional money into that budget. Oh, yeah. our, schools should, our schools should be insanely great. They should be like the, the, the enterprise on Next Generation. There should be holodecks and all kinds of cool stuff. <laughs> Americans, uh, Americans are keenly aware of the problem with the educational system. That's why everybody's like, yes, we should have a lottery. We should totally have a lottery, and that money can go to help the schools. But it's not. It's not additional money. It's instead of, and that's a problem. Boy, we, we kind of spiraled uh, away here from the RNC in Cleveland.
Well, I don't think there's anything wrong with talking about big ticket issues. You know, I mean, these Me are all neither. the things that we'd like to see our politicians having a conversation about. Absolutely. Uh, but a, just a couple of quick thoughts on the RNC. Go for it. Uh, no, no violence. No violence at the RNC and the CLE. So this is what was actually amazing to me about that. You're right. No violence. Everyone's really happy about that. But why did the sheriff's office come to the governor and say, uh, can you uh, overturn that uh, that open carry law that you have here in Cleveland? We're, we're afraid it might cause some problems. Hey, it was worth a shot. I think they were worried about uh, Black Lives Matter and Black Panthers, and then you throw in bikers for Trump into the mix, and if people are running around with firearms, if something did happen, it's like in Dallas, man. Uh, in Dallas, when, when shots ring out, and there was a bunch of people in Dallas in that march with, with rifles, and, and the smart guys, I tell you what, there was, that, there was that one guy on Twitter who everybody thought was the bad guy for a while. Remember that? Yep. And, and that poor dude, he got some great advice from his brother. Like, right after the shootings went down, he knew his little brother had a had a rifle. And he says, like, you go give that thing to a cop as soon as you can. I mean, as soon as you can, turn your rifle over. You can collect it later. You, they'll put it in the lost and found. They'll hold on to it for you. But I just don't, I just don't think you wanted a bunch of uh, people walking around with firearms in case there was violence. And you know what? And good for the governor uh, for saying no. Listen, we've got open carry laws, so this is what you get. Now you have when when we when you say it's legal to walk around with a rifle, well then by God, it's legal to walk around with a rifle. And they did it, and nothing happened. And that is awesome. And that is awesome. That is everything that is good with America, and I celebrate it with sprinkles and icing. <laughs> well, now you're just making me hungry. That's right. Hey, how about that Melania Trump speech, huh? Ha, huh. so, yeah, I the mean... The story that broke the internet. Which was surprising, because ultimately it seemed like such a non-story. Because it was a non-story. They just had to go after, they just had to go after him for something. They gotta find something. And, I mean, here, here's the truth of the matter, though, and to be slightly critical of her, she gave a perfectly good speech. She was articulate, she was well-spoken, she looked amazing up there, but there was nothing about the speech that was wowing, that was over the top. I think that if you take pretty much anyone and do what she did, which is work with a speechwriter for five to six weeks and then practice with the teleprompter, I think they could have given that speech. It wasn't the speech that Donald Trump gave on Thursday. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, there's go, they're going to find something wrong. They being, uh, you know, the media. They have to find something wrong. Yes. Like with Melania's speech. And now, even today, they're still talking about it. Even today, when, like, the, the odd, the, the ratio is still like eight to one in terms of the attention that they gave to Melania's speech to Donald Trump's speech. It is insane. They, they float out these balloons are like floated out about what's going to stick, what's going to stick. And then they just, they being the mainstream media, uh, they just steer into the curve. Melania. And now they're, they're, of course they're blaming, uh, Donald Trump for it and Paul Manafort for like, then they should have blamed the speechwriter, but then they blamed, uh, Melania Trump and the blah, 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 blah. It's like, wow, just what a non story because we can play the plagiarism game. Uh, you know, Joe, uh, Biden had to drop out of the presidential race because of a, a plagiarism thing a few years back. Obama plagiarizes people. He, he ripped off another, uh, a dude from Illinois years ago. It like, it happens. She doesn't have a professional speechwriter helping her. It was some like former ballerina chick who helped her out. Yeah. So yeah, it was bad. Yeah, it was uh, someone who worked for the Trump organization named Meredith McIver who actually just resigned from the organization over this. Yeah, yeah. And then here's like with with Donald Trump's speech, like like we're talking about the LBGTQ thing. You could tell, and and like as a as a stand up as a performer, I can tell like he was very very nervous. And that's why he was so loud and everything, every word was like he just didn't want to mess up. He just didn't want to mess up. He knew what was at risk. And so 
the the tweets that were coming out and then everyone's going oh my gosh it's so long oh my gosh it's so long and then you can just watch it as you're watching the twitter feed go you're like okay well this is what's going to stick nobody is going to talk about the substance nobody's going to talk about what he says because they are going to go with oh it was long it was long well, isn't this one of the things that people were concerned about from the beginning about Donald Trump's campaign? Because what he was able to do was sort of grab all the media attention from all of the Republican candidates. And there was some concern that once it became a one-on-one -on -one conversation between him and the Democratic nominee, he wouldn't be able to lord it about his policies the same way. Is that what's happening right now? Well, it's, I mean, I really, I, I don't think he has a, uh, a shot, you know? I don't think he has a shot. When it goes, when he, it's, it's gonna be so bad when he's up against the organization. And the organization is the Clinton organization, the, the DNC, and the, the media that is just going to run with these, these false stories, these, crazy uh attack it's like, it's like what Laura Ingram Laura Ingram gave a phenomenal speech did you see it I did and I also know what stole the thunder out from it completely what was that Michael that would be someone snapped a photo of her waving to somebody and for a split second it, it looked like a Nazi salute so that was it that was it and you could just see someone in their in their ivory tower go well that's what we're going to do that's how we will undercut this and this is the image that we'll present to the world i'm looking at a photograph right now and go to uh, flipside loftus on twitter go to flipside loftus because there you will see in my images some wonderful photos of uh Hit uh hillary clinton doing a nazi salute i have those under there so we can go tit for tat. I never want to be the tit for tat guy. I want to be the fun, funny, isn't this crazy? Uh, however, it's, it's like, uh, the Wizard of Oz and, and I'm, I'm starting to, to realize, yes, there is, a, a wizard behind that curtain. There's a, there's a dude back there, uh, pulling the strings. When you start to pay attention, my buddy, uh, Alonzo Bowden, <clears throat> very funny comic. He's completely uh, politically different th uh, than I am. He's he's a, a big time uh, liberal, but his last uh, one hour special was like, "Who's paying attention?" And it's it. My, I th I used to mock people who would get like outraged and all bent out of shape. But you know what? I think I think they were paying attention longer than I was. I'm like new to the whole uh, outrage game. Well, I know what you're outraged about this week, and that's uh, we got confirmation about all of the taxes that the Democratic National Committee has been using uh, since the, the election began. Do we want to talk about the WikiLeaks dump? Let's. We might as well just attack that. that that's the big story. I'm, I'm looking over here. Uh, oh, and just a, a fun to know fact. Uh, they've, they've already got this. is We record this Sunday. Right, as we're speaking right now, it's Sunday. They already have more protesters in Philly than they did for the entire convention in uh, Cleveland. Well, I, mean I think... I think that the Democratic National Convention in Philly is just going to com uh, be a complete and uh, total just – it's going to be a shit show. It's just going to be a uh, major. And right now, the, 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 the lit match has been thrown onto the pile of gasoline-soaked leaves uh, by WikiLeaks. So, it, so to cover what happened this week um... – Essentially, WikiLeaks released a whole bunch of emails that the Democratic National Committee had put out, and it essentially confirmed what we already knew, that there was a Hillary Clinton bias in the Democratic Party from the beginning. Yes. And uh, I think anyone who was shocked by that would also be shocked by the fact that water is wet. And that is what they're trying to make the story about. That is what everybody uh, is trying to make the story about. Like, oh, well, of course they were uh, biased uh, against uh, Bernie Sanders. Who's shocked by that? Are we shocked by that? Here is the shocking part for me. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. It is the Chuck Todd of it all. It is the meet the press of it all. It is the head of MSNBC. Those are the emails I'm outraged about. 
when Debbie Wasserman Schultz writes an email to Chuck Todd from Meet the Press saying this has to stop, and when she criticizes uh, the program Morning Joe because she didn't like that they were being nice to Bernie Sanders, that's that's horrible. That undermines our democracy, dude. When when one political party can go into a media outlet, a, 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 a supposed news outlet, and change the story, that terrifies me. Now, on the flip side, with Michael Loftus on the television show, and this clip is coming out. We're going to put this clip out uh, tomorrow, Monday. Which I is spoke- the day that this gets released anyway, so it, it's up already. Fantastic. I did a interview with Cheryl Atkinson, who used to be a – she was a reporter for CBS. Very fair, very, very fair uh, journalist. And when she criticized the Obama administration and when she brought it to people's attention that the media, CBS, was being manipulated by the Democratic Party, she was fired. And, and this is where I go outraged. And now I'm in full tinfoil hat mode. I don't give – Really, two dams about uh, Bernie Sanders. Yeah, we all knew. We all knew that that everybody was in the bag uh, for Hillary. I find it disgusting that they attacked him for his faith. I find it disgusting that they were like, "Hey, let's use the fact that he's Jewish against him." That is vile and disgusting. I find it disgusting when they talk about Latinos and the vo- and their voting block and their votes as if they're commodities that you can buy and sell at a supermarket. I find that disgusting. However, at the top of my list of things that offends me, it is a political party that can and does affect the media. And there are people, there are good people in this country who look to CBS News like, okay, that's a real news outlet. They look to CNN. They think, okay, this is real news. They look to MSNBC. They look to Meet the Press. They look to NBC as if this is real news. And I used to make fun of these people who, who would say, oh, that's not real news. That's just to- – it is. It is propaganda. And when we cannot uh, trust journalism in this country, when we know for a fact they are trying to – affect our democracy, that's full stop, bro. That is full stop. We have to be outraged. If, if you are a, a Democrat, if you're a Republican, if you're an Independent, if you're a Green Party person, if you're a Libertarian, you have to be offended by this, and you have to scream about it, and you have to never stop screaming. I'm never going to stop. It is gross. It is gross and disgusting. And anti, it's anti-democratic. Uh, and if you go to Flipside Loftus uh, on Twitter, you'll see. I, I, I'm calling these, I'm asking these people, hey, hey, Chris Matthews. I think Chris Matthews loves America. I really do. I think, uh, I think Chris Hayes does too. All in with Chris Hayes. I think he loves America. Are they going to stand by and let this happen? Chuck Todd has to go. He has to go. Well, who do you think has to go more? Is is the media the problem or is the DNC the problem? Because most of the calls right what, now is that, that Debbie Wasserman Schultz won't, will be the one who won't survive this. You know who else has to go? Okay, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, uh, she has to go. The head of CBS News, David Rhodes' brother. Let's not forget that. Ben Rhodes uh, – I think it's Ben Rhodes who works in the White House. Yeah. He gave a big he gave a, a a big interview in the New York Times. The New York Times bragging about how the Iran deal uh was sold to reporters, how your average reporter is 23 years old, you can lead him around by the nose and you can tell him where the story is. His brother uh runs CBS News. That guy's got to go. You got to go. Well, I mean if we, if we cannot trust journalism, we're all done. We're all done. Thank, and then I, I was about to say, thank God for Twitter. I was about to say, thank God for Facebook. But we know now, for a fact, that Facebook won't allow uh, certain viewpoints on Facebook. If you are pro-conservative, your your idea, your thread will get squashed. And boy, howdy, Andrew, uh, this the hashtag the hashtag is DNC leak, right? Yep. DNC leak. And I was using that yesterday, and I'm watching thousands of tweets, thousands of tweets. And it was trending at number six. And then an hour later, it's trending number one. And then an hour after that, guess what? 
It wasn't trending at all. But you know what was trending? Dora the Explorer. Dora the Explorer was trending with over like 600 people are talking about this subject. I'm like, are you shitting me? Okay, so building upon that, because this is the perfect segue to talk about the fact that Milo Yiannopoulos was actually kicked off of Twitter this week, and he yeah. was sort of considered the sacrificial lamb for hate speech. Because like Milo or not, because some people see him as a crusader for truth, others see him as a giant troll, but he does have his viewpoint, and everyone in this country is allowed to have free speech. But if they're kicking Milo off, who do you think the sacrificial lamb should be on the liberal side? Well, I don't think I, I don't think it's a tit for tat. I think it's either an open and free exchange of ideas, or it's not. And then people, here's what, here's the other like truly frightening thing out of this. And I'm sorry, this is not a very funny one. This is just me like really, really freaked out about the future of our country. Uh, instead of saying Twitter should be about a free and open exchange of ideas. Uh, people are like, well, you know what? Twitter's a private company; they can do whatever they want. So they can. So okay. So it's fine if it's your. It, it's fine if it's your political enemy. But when they come for you, what are you going to say? And and of course they're right. Twitter is a privately held. You know, it is a private company. They can do whatever they want. Maybe there is no freedom of speech on Twitter, right? Obviously there isn't. But don't pretend like there is. Twitter loves to pretend like they are. They are misrepresenting themselves. And and I tell you what, when, uh, you know, free Milo was the hashtag, and I was using it, and it was trending, 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 and then all of a sudden it wasn't. They just made it disappear. It's fucking George Orwell shit, man. It's 1984. People think that Facebook, oh, there's an algorithm there, and mathematically, blah, 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 blah. No, it's not a free and open exchange of ideas. If they do not like your idea, they will make you disappear. And Twitter is the exact same thing. And I don't know where else to go. Well, if only you had a podcast that we released every week, Michael. I tell you, and I'm t this is going to sound paranoid, too, but those will be next, man. Those are next. I'm getting real conspiracy. That's a uh, attack the messenger. They attack the messenger. Uh, they make the person go away. Really, my whole thing in this is like I want to make uh, uh, being a Republican fun again. I think we're we're selling something better. We are we're selling liberty. We're selling freedom. And I tell you what, I don't know where they're going to let me sell it. I don't think they're going to let me sell it on Facebook. I don't think they're going to let me sell it on Twitter. Where am I allowed to sell it? The TV show, the flip side with Michael Loftus, the flip side, the TV show, right? That, it's a fun TV show. I criticize the left. I criticize the right. Yeah, I lean to the right. I think, I think we have better ideas. However, I try, people are so, uh, concerned about that show. Oh, it's hate speech. I'm gonna get sued. It's gonna be hate speech. I'm gonna get sued. And it's not. It's the farthest thing away. I tell you what, and it's, and it's, I, I want to get, that's, that's who we should re reach out to. John Stewart. John Stewart. Did you see him on Colbert? Absolutely. He goes on this big rant where, hey, Sean Hannity, I don't know why he picked Sean Hannity, but he's like, you don't own patriotism, you piece of shit. You don't own the American flag. You don't own the, uh, being a good American. You bad person, you, you bad person. Well, I want to say this to John Stewart. You don't own comedy. You aren't the only person that's allowed to make uh, jokes about politics. The left does not own mockery. If I want to make fun of Debbie Wasserman Schultz and her jacked up hairdo and her crossed eyes and her fucked up teeth, you better believe I'm going to. I'm, oh, oh, I'm fired up now. It's on American. This isn't some socialist country. This is supposed to be the United States of America, guy. Woo! <laughs> <sighs> Roger Ailes, Roger Ailes stepped down. That's uh, yeah. I mean, there there's a lot going on there because Gretchen Carlson seems like she may have just been the straw that broke the camel's back. Uh, for those, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I mean, for the for those who aren't I, see, familiar, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. I was going to a joke. I was going to make a really bad joke. <laughs> And and I'm sure that it, we would celebrate that low hanging fruit joke here on right? the podcast. Um, but and see, that's I'm keeping it classy. I'm keeping it classy. <laughs> our friend, our friend John Favreau 
has a uh, podcast called Keeping It 1600, and I got one, Keeping It Classy. <laughs> So, hey. Ro- yeah, so Roger Ailes, he got, he left. You know what? And good for him. I'm, it's very, very sad. It's very sad. Well, I mean, what does it say about the status of the channel as a whole? Because now Rupert Murdoch himself is going to be running it, allegedly. What they're really expecting is James Murdoch is going to be the one who's going to be running all the day to day operations. Do you think that there's going to be a fundamental shift at the channel without Roger Ailes? No, I mean, I think the formula works. Obviously, the formula works. Fox News is, you know, number one on cable for 25 years in a row. I mean, they're incredibly successful. They're incredibly successful. And this is the other thing that, uh, you know, the, the media that has been bought and paid for by the Democratic Party, uh, they have made Fox News the villains in all this. I mean, the, I mean this is beyond the Roger Ailes thing. This is like people just dismiss Fox News. They have villainized uh, Fox News. Let's not forget that uh, that Obama, like, for a while there, he tried to kick him out of the press conferences. He's like, I'm not going to let him in. They're not real news. The frustration that people have with Fox News as a whole is that they are news from roughly 11 o'clock in the morning until 8 o'clock at night. Before that, they have Fox and Friends, which is an infotainment show. And after 8 o'clock, that's when you have Hannity. That's when you have Bill O'Reilly. And those are infotainment. You're getting people's opinions lumped in with the news. And they've been very upfront about that from the beginning. Now, where people get upset with Fox News is when the two sort of start to mesh. Because when you're in the 11 to 8 p.m. segment and you start talking about ideas that started in the after hours infotainment segment and then reporting that as news that's where people get upset and the truth of the matter is they're not the only ones who are guilty of it msnbc does the same thing on the liberal side and they make the same things happen with their ideas you know who else does who's that cnn you know who else does uh cbs you know who else does abc they just don't say it's infotainment they literally have their marching orders they're in the wikileaks like the DNC reaches out to these, at least Fox News says, well, it's kind of infotainment. But I'm telling you, this is my, this is my distress here. Well, the DNC reaches out to these people. People think they're getting the news, and they're not. They're getting talking points. So Chuck Todd, this was several months ago, when he was on Meet the Press, Meet the Press is trying to appeal to a younger demographic now because my generation, the millennials, they don't really watch news in that form anymore. So they're pulling people that have some sway with my generation. So there was an interview, it was with Louis Black, it was with W. Kamau Bell, and it was with a third female comedian. And Chuck Todd just has to listen to this rant that Lewis Black goes on, and he's like, well, you know, we know that the news media is never going to go off on the administration. And Chuck Todd just flat out says, well, yeah, that's because if we go off on them, we're going to lose all of our access. That's not okay anymore. No, it's not okay. I, I, I want to bring this to, like, it is a systematic, the White House, uh, someone decides and it's probably like a little think tank in the white house and the in the democratic national committee like here's how we're going to go after x uh like with uh latinos they literally have a memo uh that says hispanics are the most loyal brand consumers in the world that's an unknown fact so we need to extend our success in the 2016 elections we need to own hispanic loyalty and so so they have a a systematic way that they're going to attract Latino voters. Now, when it comes to the other thing they have to do is they have to demonize whoever it is on the Republican side, right? Yes. So someone says, we're going to talk about the Donald Trump speech. The Donald Trump, he had solutions. He talked about trade. He talked about helping everybody. He talked about growing our economy. He talked about making uh, big changes. And he also had some stu- substance there on how he was going to do it. Now, that didn't fit, so what they decided to do was describe his uh, speech as dark, okay? Okay. Whenever you start hearing the same catchphrases, this this is when you know the the jig is up. The Washington Post, their headline, 
Uh, Trump's America is a dark and desperate place. CBS News. Donald Trump offers dark vision. NBC News. Uh, Darn uh, Donald Trump takes America on a journey to the dark side. CNBC. Trump's emotional and dark message. Rolling Stone. Trump's dark fear-mongering speech. Huffington Post. Trump's dark and scary night. Mother Jones. Dark soul of the GOP. New Yorker. Dark, dark convention. The Nation. Dark convention speech. The Boston Globe. Dark, frightening... Is, do you think that that is just all uh, circumstantial evidence? Well, no, there's no question about it. But what they're feeding off of is not so much Donald Trump. It's sort of where they saw everything happening in the convention as a whole. Because you have Antonio Sabato Jr. standing up and calling Barack Obama a Muslim. No, no, dude. This was just about Trump's speech. All of those headlines were just about Trump's speech. But and they all they all chose. It's not like it wasn't dire. It wasn't uh, dour. It wasn't frightening. It was all dark, 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 dark. Debbie Wasserman Schultz or someone said we need to describe it as dark, and so they did. All of them, and that's a frightening list. That they all went along with it. It's deeply, it's deeply concerning. The Washington Post, CBS News, NBC, CNBC, Rolling Stone, Huffington Post, Mother Jones, New Yorker, The Nation, The Boston Globe, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. That's at least 10 that I would now suggest are bought and paid for by the DNC. You know, and I hate to pull you away from this because I know how strong you feel about this, but... I think we do have to talk a little bit about what's going to happen at the Democratic convention next week. I mean, what are your thoughts? What do you think the storyline is going to be there? Well, I know one of the storylines is how, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, what's uh, Tim Kaine, who speaks fluent Spanish, is a great addition to the party, and how Tim Kaine, who speaks fluent Spanish... Uh, is just a great pick, and how Tim Kaine, who's, you, you, it's impossible to say the guy's name, Tim Kaine, who speaks fluent Spanish, without saying, speaks fluent Spanish. I think it's all gonna be sunshine and lollipop. I think, uh, we're gonna see things like Hillary Tr Trump, uh, uh, Hillary Trump, uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, has a brave vision, right? Then they're gonna float the historic nature of it again, but they're gonna realize uh, first woman president, it's not tracking well, but she's got a brave, uh, she's got a brave positive outlook for the future, and, uh, all of the media, the, the newspapers and the TV shows, and they'll all jump on board how it's a, uh, a brave vision, and how she's gonna help us all, and we're gonna grow the economy from the, and she's gonna be optimistic. She's gonna be optimistic. Now, what is gonna be a worse decision? Having Tim Kaine speak Spanish when he actually gives his acceptance speech or letting Lena Dunham speak at all? I tell you what, Lena Dunham doesn't matter. Ultimately, she's an also ran. She just doesn't matter. And I would love it. I would love it if Tim Kaine, uh, who speaks fluent Spanish, gave his entire speech in Espanol. That would be one. That would be the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah, but I think that's about as likely as them pulling a runaround on us and saying, nope, Elizabeth Warren's actually going to be the VP. Ah, yeah, yeah, Pocahontas. <laughs> Pocahontas can't be the VP. I want to see what's going to happen with Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders, do you think he'll kiss uh, kiss the ring of Hillary? I after do. After he knows for a fact he was thrown under the bus? He I knows do. it for a fact, guy. No, I, I still think he's going to do it because I don't think – he wants to live in a world. I don't think he benefits from a world where Donald Trump is president, and he knows that. Yeah, he does. He does benefit. He does benefit. How so? From a Donald Trump presidency. He really does. Well, please t t tell us how. In the same way Ted Cruz benefits from a Hillary Clinton presidency. Like the thing that, like Bernie Sanders, if Donald Trump, if Donald Trump gets elected, then Bernie Sanders, it's in, I'm sure, I mean, he's not getting any younger. 
But if Donald Trump becomes president, then Bernie Sanders can go, come on, you guys. The last time, the system was rigged against me. But if we all join forces now, then we can fight Darth Trump, and we can end the evil empire. Come, come, come with me now. It's a revolution. It's a revolution. Then he really does. It's, it's Father Time is Bernie Sanders' biggest uh, enemy. If he was a younger man, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. If Bernie Sanders was like uh, 50, uh, he would not bend his knee to Hillary Clinton, he would be fighting this tooth and nail. And he would be setting himself up for 2020, just like Ted Cruz tried to set himself up for 2020. Ted Cruz, Ted Cruz needs Hillary to win. He needs her to win. So he can be the, I told you so guy. I told you so. I tried, but you didn't listen. And then they'll run Ted Cruz in 2020, and then he will lose again. So what does that say then about the leadership of the Republican Party that they would actually back that? Because, I mean, for a while, Ted Cruz was the guy. He was the one who was going to stop Donald Trump and be a real conservative and unite the until, party. Until the American people spoke. The American people were – it's not like it's not like Ted Cruz was never an option. He was an option. Uh, and, and there was a bunch of other options. Bush was an option. Marco Rubio was an option. I think, keep your eye on Marco Rubio. He might be the guy who comes around in 2020. He might be the guy. Oh, I'm sure he will be the guy. I think there's no question about that. I don't think that uh, the Republicans want anything to do with Ted Cruz after this. And Marco Rubio, he's still very young. He's very well-spoken. He's good-looking. And Uh, if he could fix whatever's going on with his mouth, he'd be great. (laughs) I'm, I mean, I'm, it's, it's kind of half a joke, and, I, and I, if I, it is like low-hanging fruit, but I find, it, I find it hard to watch when he's constantly doing that, that lip-smacky thing. Like, what's going on? Like, yeah. what is going on with that? Probably trying to avoid when he gave the rebuttal after the State of the Union and he had to awkwardly grab for some water. I, do you think he's on some kind of medication that prevents his mouth from making saliva? I, I think that's what it is. There's some kind of weird thing going on there he should be upfront and honest about that he should go hey i got a thing i take medicine for it and so my mouth doesn't make any spit so i gotta constantly like make this face and and we should stress we we don't have that on any authority whatsoever uh other than uh you don't need authority just you watch him and you're like wow something's wrong with that guy (laughs) oh andrew i i fear for america all right well And, and ultimately Ultimately, what the party needs, what the Republican Party needs, is a fair fight. That's all we need, is a fair fight. That in a free exchange of ideas, uh, the conservatives, the libertarians, the people who love liberty uh, and the pursuit of happiness, they get to put forth their message. And then the Democrats, they get to put forth their message on a free, on an equal playing field. And I have, it has just been hammered home to me over the weekend just how unfair the playing field is. And, and I tell you what, for a, for a party like the Democratic Party that's all about freedom and equality, you know, and affirmative action and equality and equality and civil rights and equality, for, for, for them to be the party that is so terrified of an open and free exchange of ideas that they need to manipulate the press and manipulate the news. Uh, it is home cooking. What are, are they so afraid of? I tell you what, you know what this country needs? This country needs, and I'm, and I'm not even kidding here, the flip side with Michael Loftus. And they need, it needs the Loftus party more than ever. You can't call it hate speech, guys. You can't. It is liberty. It is freedom of speech. I am uh, making fun of you, you, you liberals who are so terrified of having a real discussion about about the future of the country. Well, you know they're all bought and paid for, man. They're all bought and fa- paid for. You know where we can fix that, Michael? Where in Michaeltopia? I tell you what. Uh, somebody tweeted this the other day. Michael Leatherwood at Leatherwood Mike tweeted: Michaeltopia looks better and better every day. That's what I like to hear. Michael Topia does sound better every day. Michael Topia is a fun little bit. Michael Topia is a fun little gag we do. And uh, as each day goes by, unfortunately, Michael Topia gets a little and a little farther away from re- reality. 
However, it is time for us to go there. The real world makes less and less sense, America. The real world gets more and more disturbing every day. But there's a place where things make sense, and that's called Michaeltopia. And Andrew Apple, take us there. Do you have a, a, a new law for Michaeltopia? I do. <clears throat> In Michaeltopia, you get to vote your conscience, but not on the convention floor. Everyone gets to vote their conscience in the voting booth and then stop whining when your guy doesn't win and support the guy who did. Boom. There you have it. There you have it. it it's like, That's a good one. This conscience vote is so insane to me because what you're calling is voting your conscience is consciously ignoring the will of the people, right, right or wrong. It, it's like I, I can understand that there are people who don't agree with Donald Trump, but if you sign up to be a delegate, then you are representing a bunch of people who wanted things voted a certain way. Yes, <clears throat> yes. And if you're a delegate and your state, they overwhelmingly voted for Donald Trump, and you had some little thing where like, well, I've been freed up, and I'm going to go behind the will of the people and do what's truly best. Uh, it's a dangerous place. I mean, you don't want mob rule. And I think that's what most of the, the Never Trump people think. They're like, they, they honestly, genuinely think America has lost its mind. And it's like we're all just crazy people with uh, torches and pitchforks uh, supporting Donald Trump. And we're going to save people from themselves. But that's the very thing that I hate about the, the Democrats. The very thing I hate about uh, big government is they want to save me from me. I do not need saving. I'm doing fine. And every time you try to save me, it makes my life harder. So stop it. Touche. What do you got for us, Michael? I have, uh, in Michaeltopia, political parties do not manipulate the media. And when they do, people freak out. People freak out. People like me freak out and they dedicate, like, hours of their lives <laughs> recording podcasts about it. The lack of people freaking out about this uh, is is worthy of a giant freakout. Every, everybody's like, oh, of course the Democrats uh, rigged the system for Hillary. Oh, of course they run all these news outlets. Wake up. It's like, no, this is really, really bad. This is the worst thing. This goes way beyond Watergate. This makes... And, and this makes Hillary Clinton's email thing look small in comparison. We have proof, frickin' proof, that news outlets are, are being spoon-fed stories. That's just, it's, it's the worst. It's the worst. I have another one. Please. In Michaeltopia, I am in at least one Star Wars movie. <laughs> when I... When I was a kid, I was like, I wish I was in that Star Wars movie, right? Yeah. And then they, the, and then I knew there was only going to be three. It was going to be A New Hope, Empire Strikes Back, and Return of the Jedi. And after Return of the Jedi, I'm like, that's it. I will never be in a Star Wars movie. Then uh, comes Lord of the Rings, right? And I'm like, holy smoke, I'd love to be in Lord of the Rings. And then I wasn't, and I'm like, okay, that's it. I'll never be in a Lord of the Rings movie. Then The Hobbit comes along, a buddy of mine is working on the production in New Zealand and tried to make some things happen, I couldn't get down to New Zealand, so I'm like, okay, I'm never going to be in one of those movies. Now Star Wars has fired back up again, and J.J. Abrams is like handing out little guest spots in Star Wars movies like tickets at a fair. Like, if you know J.J. Abrams, you can get in one of these movies. So... If you like the Loftus party, and if you like uh, the flip side with Michael Loftus, and you know anybody who can get to J.J. Abrams, please uh, direct message me on Twitter, find me on Facebook. I need to be in a Star Wars movie. I'll be a stormtrooper. I'll stand in the back. I don't even have to have a line. Uh, I just want—I just want to be in one of the movies. <laughs> It was a big weekend for movies. It was. That was actually my next Michaeltopia, if you don't mind. Go for it. All right. In Michaeltopia, if Warner Brothers breaks my heart again with Justice League the way they did with Batman v Superman, they need to pay me half of whatever they paid Will Smith to be in suicide just because they hurt my feelings. 
I tell you what, that's a great one. That's a great one. And I can just tell you, like, my big beef with Batman versus Superman was they got the dynamic wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Like, they had Batman being the truth, justice, and the American way guy, and they were trying to make Superman look like the vigilante. They have done it again, uh, and they're going to do it again. So prepared to have your heart broken. I watched the Justice League trailer. It looks cool. Aquaman. Flickman. Aquaman looks cool. Wonder Woman looks great. Everybody looks really cool. However, you have Batman uh, trotting around the globe going, I need your help. I'm putting together a Justice League. Like, no, no. Batman is the guy who never wanted to be in the Justice League. Batman is the guy who's like, this is very dangerous. Because you know what Batman knows? What does Batman know? Batman knows that absolute power corrupts absolutely. And and who watches the Watchers? Which this is a, a the perfect tie-in uh, bookend to the entire podcast right here, Andrew. Who watches the Watchers? And, and I, that's the bat. That's the Batman we're not seeing on screen. And that is what we're not seeing in real life. If you are the head of CBS News and your brother works for the White House, then you're answering to the White House. You're not answering to the people who is watching the head of cbs news who is watching chuck todd who is making sure that it's real news we need to get we need to get ben affleck we should put batman in charge we should have ben affleck <laughs> wear the batman suit he has to wear the batman suit at least half of the day and he has to make sure that all these news outlets uh act responsibly there you go okay wonder woman wonder woman looks great that movie looks great. Here was my here was my tweet about that. I saw the new Wonder Woman trailer. I saw the lasso. I saw the bracelets. Didn't see the invisible jet. Oh wait, what I'm saying? <laughs> the jet's invisible. <laughs> but up, but up, bump, bump. <clears throat> Doctor Strange looked great. I'm looking forward to that. Tell us did more. See, did you see the Doctor Strange? One? Oh yeah, no, I've I've watched. Trust me, I've watched every trailer. <laughs> oh, it's fantastic. It's like they took that effect that they invented for Inception where the skyline is all twisty-turny, mm -hmm. and they just gave that a, a bunch of uh, steroidal growth hormones. And, boy, if you like twisty-turny skylines, you're going to love Doctor Strange. And I like me the Benedict Cumberbatch. Everyone likes the Benedict Cumberbatch. It's hard not to like the Benedict Cumberbatch. Woo! It's hard yeah, to he's say great. Benedict Cumberbatch, though. It is hard to say Benedict Cumberbatch. And for some strange reason, I feel compelled. Uh, before we got started today, you were singing that Cup song, that When I'm Gone, When I'm Gone. Yes, I let's was. Give, let's give a shout out to the people that started that song, the real people that started it, not that girl from the movie. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of a background, Anna Kendrick took the idea of doing the cup song and moving around the cups from uh, Lulu and the Lampshades. So if you go on YouTube and you search for Lulu and the Lampshades, you're going to see two girls who are doing the exact same thing that Anna Kendrick did, only they're doing it years before. And then Anna Kendrick ran with it, and she's the one who got all the credit. So in Michael Topia, we celebrate Lulu and the Lampshades, the originals. I love it. That's a great way to frame that. In Michael Topia, we give credit to the people who invent it, right? Yes. Nikolai Tesla. Thank you for radio, Nikolai Tesla. Everybody talks about Marconi, but thank you, Nikolai Tesla. And uh, we also uh, thank you. Who's the guy who did the theory of evolution? Theobra Darwin. Everybody says Charles Darwin. Guess what, everyone? You ready for this? It was Charles Darwin's grandfather. It was his grandfather. Charles Darwin is just the guy who published the book. So everybody's like, oh, Charles Darwin, he invented it. No, it was his grandfather. We give credit where credit is due here. Bada bing, bada boom. It was a very angry show, but sometimes that's what we need. Next week, uh, I think we're going to try to have a guest. I think we're going to try to have uh, Michael Steele on. He's, he's probably going to be in Philadelphia. We might have to go a different way. I swear, next week there will be more sunshines, and there will be more rainbows, and there will be more smoke blown up buttholes. <laughs> However, uh, this one had to be a little angry. This one had to be a little angry. But I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go 100% full tilt angry all the time because that's boring. I like to laugh. I smile more because I'm right. So there you have it. Uh, thanks for listening. Do me a favor. Go to uh, iTunes. Leave a little review. 
clicks on some stars. Say a little something. Say you hate it. I don't give a dang. Some kind of activity that helps towards the algorithm. It's all good. And we, you gotta listen to, uh, friends of the show. We got some friends of the show. Uh, your podcast, Andrew Apple, is... So Fresh, So Prince. A buddy of mine and I were rewatching every episode and doing deep dives of the Fresh Prince of Bel Air week by week. And I don't understand how it happens, but every week we do it, we deal with some sort of thing that's happening in the news. Because we actually get a lesson from Carlton this week on everything he learned from the 1992 Republican National Convention. Okie dokie. What'd you learn? Uh... Well, uh, his take on it was that uh, there were, were a lot of liars at the Republican National Convention, so I don't think we actually take the lessons from it. <laughs> Imagine that. A hit show on M- on NBC uh, that was just going to put forth, there's a bunch of liars at the Republican Convention. That's great. That ties in perfectly to this show. All right, you want to yeah, hear a funny little story? I do, but then I think we might have some breaking news. Uh, but tell me your story first. Uh, my story is this, that uh, I, I'm working on a sitcom right now, and uh, I get there's a lot of good like backstories to sitcoms and behind-the-scenes stuff. Remember a show called Family Ties? I do. Alex P. Keaton. That's right. Family Ties was set up to be, the sitcom was supposed to be about the husband and wife, and about a hippie husband and a hippie wife, and, uh, and how they made their way in the world and held on to their hippie values in modern America. Well... When Michael J. Fox, when his character, Alex P. Keaton, the Republican, was uh, the successful breakout star of that, it drove the show creator nuts because he wanted to do this piece of propaganda about how awesome the hippies are and how awesome liberals are, and it drove him crazy that the Republican kid was the breakout star. Ronald Reagan, a sitting president at the time, called up the show and said, I'd love to do a guest spot. I'd love to be on the show. And they said no. They refused the president of the United States because they didn't want to make Republicans look good or fun. All right. So I got to tell you, we just got some breaking news that falls right into that subject. What do we got? Gawker just released. Debbie Wasserman Schultz is out. Of course she is. No, I mean, for real. She's not going to have any sort of significant speaking role at the convention. It looks like Ohio Representative Marsha Fudge is taking over as the DNC chair. It is official. She is gone. She is fired. Exactly. And guess what time it is? On on the East Coast, it is uh, 4 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. She has to make sure she gets out before. So now what they'll do is they'll try to quote-unquote, dedicate some airtime to this, and they're already going to start burying that story by Monday morning. And she, and once again, she's going to be fired for, for putting her finger on the scale uh, for Hillary Clinton and not Bernie Sanders. Which, once again, it is the manipulation of the media. That is the big story. And, and now no one will talk about it. It's all going to be about, oh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz is gone. So she quits on a Sunday, the new spike cycles uh, spins on, and they got to hope and they got to keep their fingers crossed that they will have some kind of breaking news event to talk about Monday so that this story will be effectively buried. All right. Well, if you want to get that news, there's only one place to come, and that is the Loftus Party. It really is the Loftus Party, that bright, shining beacon of hope high on a hill. (laughs) <laughs> the Loftus Party and the Daily Dose. Good Lord, go by that website. Stop by the website every day. It's awesome. You know what, America? I love you. I love you so much, and I'm never going to stop. I'm never going to stop. Don't hate the messenger. Hate the message. And we smile more because we're right. I love you. I'll see you next week. <laughs>